Welcome to Clark County Today. I'm your host, David Medor. Our guests today are Doug Johnson and Mark Korsness. Mark and Doug are from the Bonneville Power Administration, the BPA, and your position is a public affairs specialist. And Mark, you are the senior project manager for these new transmission lines that are scheduled to come into our area in order to provide better electrical infrastructure for us. The question is, uh, first opening question here is what is Bonneville Power Administration, what is BPA doing to uh, correct or to correct any misinformation or to minimize any negative impacts that these lines may have in order to maximize the benefit and be able to balance the cost out of this project? Yeah, well, BPA is proposing to build a new transmission line from a new substation near Castle Rock to a new substation near Troutdale. So as we consider doing that, uh, we want to involve the public and bring everybody who has an interest in the project to the table so that we can consider everything people want us to consider okay. and select the best possible route for that new transmission line. And if we do build it, to make sure that we minimize impacts to people. The Castle Rock to Troutdale is basically north to south. It's mostly north-south. Mm -hmm. the, are there connections in this area? Is this servicing Clark County, or is this part of a larger national grid? The proposed project fixes a capacity issue between the transmission system up near Castle Rock and the transmission system down near Vancouver, Troutdale, Portland. So what it does is connect up with existing lines up near Castle Rock, provides a new path or a new pipe for electricity to flow north or, or to flow south or even north if necessary uh, with the system down at Troutdale. It also completes a loop around the Vancouver, Portland area of a 500 kV system which not only increases capacity, but will increase reliability, such that if we lose any segment of that loop, we can still feed all of the substations by the rest of the loop. So th you, this part of a loop, has the, re has the other portion of the loop been constructed, or is this the first leg of it? Uh, the, this, we have a 500 kV system that runs from north to south through Castle Rock into the Portland area, and then over to Troutdale. The part we don't have is the connection between Castle Rock and Troutdale. Okay, so that, that part has already been constructed. Yes. So this completes the rest of it. I guess it gives you redundancy. It gives you more reliability. Is that it, the it reason why the loop? More capacity. More capacity to get energy in and through the area. And it's important to point out that the lines on that side, the lines that have actually been serving the area and points beyond north to south, were actually constructed in the late 60s. We haven't built a major project in this area of the northwest since 1969. It's one of the reasons that we've had to take a look at building this project because we are experiencing times when the peak energy demand in the area is spiking and it's hard to get energy in and out. Um, and it's important to point out that 75 to 80 percent of the energy that's carried through our 500 kV system into the area is actually consumed in the Portland metropolitan area. Um, Clark County, Portland points just south of Portland. Some of it does eventually travel south through the area, but a predominant amount of that energy is consumed here and will stay here. Um, so we want folks to know that and, and be clear on that point. That really seems to be kind of ama amazing, surprising that since 1969, you said, was the last major construction of a, the backbone of the power grid in this area, yet we've had all this growth and I expect you've seen a lot of increase in the consumption of electricity, mainly because of the, the it's, it's just ubiquitous, it's everywhere. Well, I guess we had a large consumer of electricity on the Columbia River uh, that was a aluminum mm -hmm. processing or smelting plant or something there. Uh, they, they use massive, massive amount, right? So that must have decreased when they, when, uh, when they stopped that business, is that right? Sure, it's a very dynamic system. So people turn on air conditioners and off air conditioners and build new homes, new factories are built, others close. So we consider all that and, and run studies that take the latest information on what has happened recently and what is likely to happen and model that. So that we've, wor as Doug said, we've worked very hard over the last 40 years to avoid building new transmission lines, try to operate the existing system 
as efficiently as we can uh, because it does cost money to, to build new transmission. So, but we've, we've utilized every, every option we have, we believe, to postpone the need to construct a new line. So as we approach that date where it's needed, we've started this process so that we're prepared to start construction and build this line should we ultimately decide to do so. And, and energy consumption has changed. The type of industry that's here a lot different. You have semiconductor companies that are here. Um, they need the clean delivery of energy. Um, if they have just a bobble on the system that wouldn't even make the lights in this room flicker, they can be throwing away tens of thousands of dollars of product. If there's just a momentary glitch in delivery of energy to one of those plants that makes those things, it's gone. A lot of products gone. So they really rely on the capacity being here to deliver energy uninterrupted in a very clean fashion. Um, and like Mark said, air conditioners, heat pumps, other types of devices that are being used now are much different than serving an aluminum plant, which is a pretty consistent sucking of energy on a regular basis. But as you get that kind of you know, up and down use of other types of products, the energy demand changes uh, and the need for capacity presents itself just as much as a big consumer of electricity like an aluminum plant. And I expect that here in the United States, if we want to be a technology leader, we need clean, reliable electricity. There's, I, I don't, I'd be surprised if there'd be much opposition to just simply uh, realizing that we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to make sure that we maintain our ability to be manufacturing, to jobs re rely on uh, reliable electricity. So that's a foundation. We need it. It's going to be built uh, because we're not going to give up our leadership in, in the world. We need to be able to have uh, reliable electricity. So if it was just a matter of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering in order to get the power from here to there and, and people weren't involved in, in the works, it would be a very simple process. But there's been a complication. And the complication is there's a perceived threat uh, that people, uh, they, they feel this, this, there's some fear. There's some fear, fear of the unknown. And I'd like to be able to have us address that a little bit. Now, the fear of the unknown there is the ELF, extreme EMF, ELF, EMF, EMF. Elec yeah. extremely low frequency well, the, yeah, electromagnetic the, that's fields. The yeah. type, that's the type of electric, yeah, the ELF. Yes. That's you're right part of the yep. electric and magnetic field equation, yep. Yep, and, is, uh, the, and the other part of this is that the property values, property values, uh, if you have a large transmission line go right by your home, then that, that's not such an, an attractive thing. People call mm -hmm. that an eyesore. And, and property values are related to desirability. You got power lines right there, big, massive power lines. Your property values are, are not gonna be as good. Uh, related to that, just simply the eye perception of it is the belief perception of people. They really look at it and they think, oh man, that must have this, this monstrous magnetic fields that could be killing me. And that perceived, even if there's nothing to it, the people, if they fear that, then they say, oh, I might consider that, but man, I'm going to have to get a, I, I'm only going to pay this much for that home. And so the perception has a whole lot to do with that, and it could make your life very difficult. Uh, if we can just talk uh, for a few minutes about uh, the EMF, electromagnetic uh, fields, mm -hmm. uh, in order to get people some kind of a benchmark as to what are we talking about here. Um, one of the things I'm, uh, I, I think is unfortunate is even the terminology that we use. Radiation. We, we electron, this is radiating magnetic fields. Well, uh, <laughs> radiation in this is not to be confused with nuclear radiation. Mm -hmm. Nuclear radiation is actual electronic particles, atomic particles, that we know the mechanism that they cause danger. They end up, we, we know exactly how that works. This has nothing to do with, electri with uh, nuclear particles mm -hmm. radiating. We have a fireplace, that, ra that radiant type of heat that radiates uh, nice warmth and there's, no, there's nothing dangerous about right. that unless you're going to inhale this stuff. Yeah. So what you're talking about are electric and magnetic fields. Um, there are electric fields and magnetic fields mm -hmm. associated with high voltage power lines. Yep. And they're all around us. Um, they are. The microwave that you use in your house, uh, the computer that you type on at home and work, 
um, all electrical products actually emit electric and magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are what people are principally concerned with because there is some epidemiological evidence out there. There are studies that show that there is a potential um, small chance that they could be affiliated with certain, certain health risks. Um, so with that understanding, I want to kick it to Mark because Mark understands having done several of these projects, or mm -hmm. several is probably an insult to Mark. Mark's been with BPA for some time and has managed numerous projects um, and has, has dealt with this issue and other issues in the environmental reviews that we do. So it would be best for Mark to kind of lay out how we handle that issue in the environmental review and what information we'll be able to present to people as this process unfolds. Okay, so. Sure, so briefly, you know, we understand how to build and site safe, reliable transmission lines. We do it all the time. But every time we propose a new project, we realize as much as we know, we don't know everything. And we can do a better job of making decisions by working with the public and elected officials and anybody who has an interest in the project. So that's why we invite everybody to the table. And we get mm -hmm. comments and ideas from them and we learn about what their concerns are. And there are dozens of things that people are concerned about. So mm -hmm. it, it really can't be reduced to just one or two top things. There sure. are, it depends on who you are, where you live, and what yeah. your interests are. W one of the things that many people are concerned about is EMF. And there, you know, el electric fields create what's called uh, a nuisance shock. So you might uh, walk up and touch your car if it's parked underneath a line and get just a little bit of a nuisance shock. We, we design our lines so that that's all you get is a very minor, minor induced shock. Which there. is the same thing as scuffing your feet across the carpet and touching the doorknob, right? It is. It's, it the, is. it's electrostatic charge. And, and, and generally there isn't any concern about health effects from that. Uh, the other side of EMF are, are magnetic fields and there are some people that are concerned about that. So mm -hmm. we're uh, dedicated to providing in the draft environmental impact statement that will be made available to everyone everything we can find out about magnetic fields and the studies that have been done about health effects and so on so that mm -hmm. people can decide for themselves because the scientific community to date uh, it, you know the the, the uh, data and research is inconclusive as to there being any negative health effects but research goes on so we're going to provide all of that to the public and in the meantime, uh, with the advice of some uh, agencies, World Health Organization and so on, we're going to implement low-cost design methods to minimize magnetic field strengths for people on the ground. Because we might as well go ahead and do that because people are concerned about that. That means we're concerned about it, so we're, we're going to do what we can there. So mm -hmm. we can do things like uh, use certain tower types and position the conductors up in the air to minimize the magnetic fields that are created on the ground. Uh, as you may know, our typical 500 kV transmission line, which is, is proposed here, uh, requires a 150 foot wide easement. And mainly to provide safe electrical clearance, we don't allow any buildings on that 150 foot wide easement. But we do allow off the easement. So uh, there are, in many cases, induced uh, magnetic fields and electric fields off of our easement. So in the environmental impact statement, we're going to provide calculations and charts that show people what those field strengths are and show how they drop off as you move away from the transmission line and across the edge of right of way and so on and have a discussion and compare those uh, numbers with, as Doug mentioned, the uh, field strengths that are created in our homes and businesses mm -hmm. and people can decide for themselves um, how, how concerned they are. And that's one of the things we consider in siting the new line. Certainly we're looking at options that route the transmission line mostly away from homes and businesses so that there isn't that concern. Mm -hmm. When it comes to just simply the perception of the danger, when people look at these uh, 500,000 volt transmission lines, they think, man, that's huge. In reality, what they're looking at, they're not looking at the actual uh, what generates the magnetic field current, they're looking at the voltage. And the voltage is why you put the lines up so high, why you have just a, such, such uh, long uh, insulators. In reality, the reason that, you, that there, these towers are so large and so high and the insulators are so long is because you guys crank the voltage way up so you can crank the current way down, right? Well, we're, we're, we're trying to get as much power through those lines as we can mm -hmm. so that we can not have to build additional lines anytime soon after. So uh, yeah, the, the voltage is what causes the wires, which are, which are bare, they're not covered in, in mm -hmm. rubber or any insulation, 
requires them to be so far off the ground, mm -hmm. so that requires tall towers. Yep, 